Good morning, Doctor. Yeah, let's give it a moment. Uh, Good morning. Dr. Condon is joining us. If uh, Tariq joins us, then we'll uh, basically be all right. Let's give it another minute or two. Let's see Josiah O'Toole is here. Good morning, Dr. Pass. This is Josiah. Good morning, Josiah. <laughs> Have an exciting day here at Mount Sinai. Our first two harmony valves. Last night we did a dry run. We're all ready. So Grace and Perna, Sergey. So I don't see David. I guess David may not. There's David joining us, and I don't see Tariq. Is Tariq sitting next to somebody, one of the fellows, or is he? Yeah, he's just logging on in right now. Okay, hi, Dave. All right, before we get going, uh, this is going to be a brief talk today. David and I had quite the weekend. I want to start by congratulating Dr. Barris, who did yeoman's work. Very, very challenging weekend with a lot of work to do. I don't think he got two hours of continuous sleep the entire weekend. Uh, David, thank you very, very much. Did a great job. Thank you so much, Dr. Pest, and thanks so much for the help and the teaching. Of course. All right. So uh, we're going to start at the uh, end of the last talk and sort of segue into therapies. And I apologize, it's gonna be somewhat brief, but we were both all a little bit busy, but um, this weekend. <clears throat> so just to remind you from the end of the talk, again, when we're talking about the mechanism of arrhythmias, we, I generally think of the level of the heart. And again, when I'm looking at an ECG of an arrhythmia, in my mind's eye, I'm sort of working from the top down. And uh, at the, you know, and I, I mechanistically divide them into automatic arrhythmias and reentrant arrhythmias. So at the level of the SA node, when we think about automatic arrhythmias, we're talking about just sinus tachycardia. And then at the level of the SA node, there is actually a condition called SA nodal reentrant tachycardia, which stops and starts and ends uh, abruptly, but has a P wave morphology that is exactly the same as sinus. And so, on the surface electrocardiogram, um, if you didn't see the stop and start, you would not actually realize that this is a re-entry. It's an unusual arrhythmia, but I have seen it maybe two or three times. Um, at the level of atrial muscle, in terms of automatic arrhythmias, we think about ectopic atrial tachycardia, uh, where we've discussed as a single focus that's firing at a rate faster than the sinus rate, or uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is sometimes in pediatrics, we refer to as a so-called chaotic atrial rhythm. That's the more common term used. Uh, and the similar to EAT, except in chaotic atrial rhythm, there are typically multiple foci, uh, so multiple different P wave morphologies. When we're talking about reentry at the level of atrial muscle, we're thinking about atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. Both of them are reentrant arrhythmias of different sorts. At the level of the AV node his bundle, we're thinking about junctional ectopic tachycardia. In fact, I think I've mentioned to you previously that JET or junctional ectopic tachycardia in some countries, as particularly in Europe, is referred to as his bundle tachycardia mm -hmm. because it is believed that the bundle of his has enhanced automaticity and is causing the uh, tachycardia. And then, uh, we, of course, we all are familiar with AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is a reentrant arrhythmia of the AV node. And we're thinking about AV reciprocating arrhythmias. There is no such thing as an automatic one, although I guess the closest thing to that might be a Maheim fiber. Some Maheim fibers do have automaticity associated with them, causing a QRS that looks like a, a PVC. And then um, when we're thinking about reentrant arrhythmias, 
we're thinking about WPW or uh, concealed accessory pathways. Any kind of accessory pathway is causing uh, atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia of some sort. And then at the level of the ventricles, VT or VF can be automatic or reentrant. So um, typically when we think about reentry in the ventricles, we're thinking about either reentry amongst the bundle branches or sometimes when patients have had a myocardial infarction in the adult world, they can have a reentrant tachycardia uh, as well. Okay, so let's move on now. So I thought we would just briefly today talk about uh, treatment for arrhythmias. And then once we're done with today's talk, we'll then go on to next week to uh, our usual unknowns and uh, discussion of various different arrhythmias and arrhythmic agents. So this is a very general discussion today. So um, when we're thinking about uh, drug therapy, there are uh, multiple drugs that are effective. And uh, it's one of the things that makes being an electrophysiologist relatively easy because pretty much all the drugs have some level of efficacy and it's, you can make an argument to start anything for anything. So uh, the most commonly used agents are digoxin, um, beta blockers, pro procainamide, verapamil, sotalol, amiodarone, and flaconide. So we'll go over very briefly these agents today just so we're all on the same page in very general terms. Um, so when we have someone with SVT uh, that involves the AV node, IV adenosine would be our most common go-to agent, which as you know, causes transient AV block. Remember always that the half-life of adenosine is measured in seconds. And for this reason, you need to use a very large flush uh, behind any dose of adenosine, if particularly in patients with single ventricles. Um, where you may not be able to deliver the adenosine as effectively to the AV node because of the uh, sluggish conduction. Remember that the AV node is, uh, could be blocked in the setting of a Fontan. Um, so typically you need to use a bigger dose. As a general rule, if you look in like Harriet Lane, they'll tell you that 50 mics per kilo is the starting dose. Usually we usually use 100 mics per kilo as our starting dose. And again, it's particularly useful for AV, AV reciprocating tachycardias, or really anything that involves the AV node because it blocks the AV node. So the classic example where it's effective is orthodromic reentrant tachycardia, uh, or of course, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. So since those are the two most common SVTs in children, probably constituting 90 to 95% of all tachycardia, it's very important to understand how to use this agent. Need a good IV, preferably one close to the heart if possible. Um, and uh, as you'll see in the cath lab, we always use a very large flush whenever we're giving uh, adenosine. Um, okay. Uh, oh, one other thing I should say about IV adenosine. As a general rule, you should not use IV adenosine in transplant patients. That's important. Uh, there was work out of Columbia a couple of years ago showing that they we're able to give adenosine to some transplant patients uh, without them dying, but there are definitely reports of patients who've received IV adenosine in the transplant, uh, transplanted patients who have had basically cardiac standstill. I myself was involved in a case many years ago when I was a fellow or a patient in the cath lab was getting a biopsy, got S had SVT, the attending gave a dose of adenosine and the patient arrested and actually we were unable to resuscitate that patient. Um, so even though the group at Columbia, Leo Lieberman and uh, Eric, uh, what's his name? Uh, Silver. Oh, thank you. Eric Silver uh, have uh, published this uh, uh, saying that it is, um, it's kosher to do that. And I believe what they wrote that it worked in their case. It does not, unfortunately, the numbers of patients in that study unfortunately not large enough to really definitively say it's safe. All I can say is that they gave it and nothing bad happened in those particular patients. But um, it, it, there are multiple explanations for why it may be dangerous in that po patient population. But I think the bottom line is we would more commonly use the next agent on this, trip, this uh, slide, which is verapamil. Uh, verapamil, uh, just so you know, uh, was used for many decades as the acute therapy for SVT in adults and even in, in older children. Um, it works fairly well, it takes about five to 10 minutes to see the effect, um, but it does have very potent negative inotropy. And um, 
it has been associated with cardiovascular collapse, particularly in infants and newborns. Um, now, uh, for that reason, IV verapamil should never be used in a newborn or in a very small infant. Um, so uh, that is, uh, you know, I guess you, today, unfortunately, we would consider that to be uh, worthy of the term malpractice. Now, the reality is that verapamil is very hard to administer slowly uh, because it comes fairly concentrated. And um, I, I think a lot of people believe that probably in retrospect, uh, when those initial reports in the early 1980s came out of babies dying or having cardiovascular collapse from IV uh, verapamil, it probably was related to the rate of infusion. I, I used to give verapamil occasionally during EP studies uh, for to cause AV nodal blockade in the setting of people who had pathways that were located on top of their AV node on the theory that maybe we could uh, separate the ERPs a little easier that way. Uh, we can talk about that in the future, but uh, the bottom line is that it's very difficult. Almost every single time I gave IV verapamil, the patient became hypotensive, even teenagers. So it's very hard to give IV without causing some hypotension. It really needs to be infused very, very slowly, like over 15 to 20 minutes in an ideal world. Um, and I think that because it comes in a concentrated manner, my suspicion is that it caused uh, problems in infants because probably it was being given too rapidly. That said, uh, unfortunately, because of those initial reports, it is now considered non-standard and wrong to give IV verapamil, even though probably it's safe if given properly. I can say that I have given diltiazem to kids under a year of age without too much trouble, but that is not as hemodynamically embarrassing as verapamil. Okay, so the bottom line is stay away from it. There's enough other agents. You don't need to use it in that setting. Okay, uh, digoxin is a useful antiarrhythmic agent in infants. And you know what I'm gonna try to do over the next couple of weeks is each week do one arrhythmia agent and go into it in a little bit more depth than we're going to today. But I just wanna sort of get it all on the right page together. Uh, digoxin can cause uh, AV nodal slowing. That's one of the mechanisms by, way, by which it works. And it also can reduce atrial ectopy. The dose is uh, between eight and 14 micrograms per kilogram per day, typically divided BID. Um, the half-life is fairly long. And for that reason, a lot of people will uh, so-called digitalize patients, meaning that they give them one or two very large doses up front in order to get the level up high rapidly. That is the standard way that one does it. And if you look it up, you can see multiple ways to digitalize children my personal bias is that digoxin is a fairly weak arrhythmia medicine. It doesn't mean it doesn't help, doesn't mean it shouldn't be used. I think it is an effective agent for some patients. But as I often joke, if you feel that you need digoxin that rapidly that you have to digitalize, I would personally argue that you probably need to be on something else because uh, dig does not work well enough that in my view, it needs to be digitalized in anybody. Uh, and the reason that I'm saying that, why would I, why would I be opposed to giving digoxin in a rapid fashion? Well, I'm not opposed to it like I have a religious belief against it, but my feeling is simply that it can rarely cause heart block or with toxicity or ectopy or, you know, it isn't an absolutely zero risk agent, particularly uh, you'll remember that hypokalemia and digoxin, that combination is very dangerous. So you always want to make sure that patients have a normal potassium when you're giving digoxin. Um, things can happen with dig. In the old days, before computerized medical records, probably the most common uh, drug error that was made was giving too much digoxin. And dig is considered a dangerous medicine IV. Uh, in fact, uh, it was very routine, even when I was a resident and a fellow, that, the, that a doctor had to give the IV digoxin. Nurses would not give IV dig when I started my career. Um, and in fact, I have seen patients get digoxin toxicity from receiving 10 times the dose because people uh, keep forgetting the whole microgram uh, issue, which is one of, the, one of many, many reasons why electronic medical records are superior to the old days when we wrote it by hand. Okay.
Beta blockers are a useful alternative antiarrhythmic agent. Uh, they also cause AV nodal slowing and reduce atrial ectopy, albeit in a totally different manner. Uh, commonly used agent is Indorol, but there are in infants, um, it can be associated with low glucose levels. And so we will get dextrose sticks a few times when starting this agent, uh, it's important. And, it's, and really one should not start this agent as an outpatient. Uh, unless there's an easy mechanism for monitoring blood glucose levels in a small infant, that is. Okay. Um, beta blockers are effective about 60 to 75% of the time. Um, and uh, they have a very low side effect profile. So oftentimes people wonder why do we use beta blockers for SVT in children? if they're only effective about 60 to 75% of the time? Well, the answer is, again, they have a very low side effect profile. They're generally well tolerated. And because SVT normally, particularly when it's well recognized by the family, uh, is uh, not life-threatening, we would generally go with a less, uh, a lower side effect profile drug, even though it may not be 100% efficacious on the theory and the truth that as we get into higher level agents, the risk for proarrhythmia or other side effects grows. And so, you know, it's like anything else. When you have a, ther when you have a, a disease that is not as dangerous, um, you can be a little bit less aggressive in therapies, at least initially. Calcium channel blockers have a similar efficacy to beta blockers, a fairly low side effect profile. Verapamil would be the most common. We don't really see very many kids on verapamil. Um, mostly because we have newer agents, but uh, verapamil is a good, a good agent. The reason we also don't use it that much in children is because it comes in a fairly large adult size, and so it's a little harder to administer to kids. Um, digoxin uh, is not as effective in older patients as it is in infancy, so it's not typically used in this age range. Um, there are rare, there are still cardiologists who use it as an SVT therapy in older patients. But I think it would be fair to say that most uh, have not do not use it in the newborn period. The other thing I should mention about digoxin is, uh, as we discussed last week, digoxin can enhance accessory path and to great conduction, and at least in theory, enhance the risk for sudden cardiac death in the setting of WPW. Uh, that is probably the most important reason why outside of the newborn or infant period, it would be wrong to give digoxin. Um, however, there are many older cardiologists generally who feel comfortable giving digoxin to small infants, even with WPW. My personal bias is that since there are other agents, why would I take that very rare risk of potentially enhancing the chance for sudden death with dig? But I don't think it would be wrong to give digoxin to a child under a year of age, even if they had WPW. Though generally speaking, I usually will lean on other agents in that setting. Okay, if those agents don't work or the simple stuff, uh, we will then go on to other agents. Um, so. Sotalol is a class three agent, meaning it has a potassium channel blockade effects. It is also a beta blocker. And um, sometimes people forget, they think that Sotalol is just a beta blocker. It is not, it is a combination agent, beta blocker and a class three agent. Uh, it is a very potent beta blocker though. Um, and the interesting thing about Sotalol is that at the lower dose range, Sotalol, you get almost the maximal beta blocker effect of the agent. Um, so typically the dosing for Sotalol is 80 to 160 milligrams per meter squared per day. Uh, it's typically divided Q8 in small children or, or Q12 in uh, adult size patients. Um, but at the lowest end at the 80 per meter squared per day, it's typically got a lot of beta blocker effect, almost all of the beta blocker effect, even if you were to go up higher, but you have very little class three effect as you go higher, you get more. So in my experience, and I think in that of most people, when using Sotalol, you end up needing to go higher in the dose uh, in order to see the uh, class three effect. And in fact, the group in Texas has reported using doses as high as 200 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, but Sotalol does have a, a definite incidence of proarrhythmia, all class three agents do. So one has to monitor anyone who starts Sotalol typically is monitored for at least 48 hours inpatient. 
on some form of telemetry in order to uh, assess for a possible proarrhythmia. Um, and uh, of course, just like any beta blocker, particularly in small infants, we would be worried about hypoglycemia. Flecainide uh, is a class 1B sodium channel blocking agent. It's also a very effective antiarrhythmic agent for SVT, uh, particularly useful in automatic tachycardias, such as ectopic atrial tachycardia. Um, but it is probably of all of the major antiarrhythmic agents that we use with some rel relative routine nature, I would say flecainide probably has the highest incidence of proarrhythmia. I don't know if any of you are aware of the so-called CAST study. Um, this was a study that was performed in adults in the, uh, I think it was really in the early 90s. You know, when you have, uh, perhaps you're aware, when you have a heart attack, a uh, myocardial infarction, the uh, most common reason you die is because you end up getting VF or VT related to the injury to your myocardium. Um, and so in the early 90s, there was surprisingly little evidence-based treatment. And so cardiologists would basically try anything for these arrhythmias. And uh, pretty much what you got on was a, basically a random thing based on what the cardiologist thought was effective. And it turned out that when somebody, uh, you know, sort of carefully and systematically studied what the outcomes were of patients after myocardial infarction with coronary artery disease uh, were placed on flecainide, that they died more, more commonly on flecainide than off flecainide. Um, that it was in fact associated with an enhanced risk for dying. Now, is it possible, it was a retrospective type of study, sort of a, a case control retrospective study. So it wasn't the most robust study of all time, but it was all that they had at the time. Is it possible that the doctors were only using flecainide in the worst patients? Possibly, but I think um, just like the story of verapamil with newborns, flecainide really uh, should never be used in patients who have coronary artery disease. And so um, uh, it's gotten a bad rap that way, but in young patients such as our patients, uh, it is a very reasonable agent. One of the problems with flecainide, though, uh, is that it has to be compounded in small children. And um, the problem with compounding this agent is that the therapeutic index of flecainide is fairly narrow. And so uh, if the parent is not careful about shaking the bottle before every dose, when the patient is at the bottom of the bottle, it is not uncommon that patients can get overdosed in flecainide. And an overdose in flecainide can truly be life-threatening. Um, and at some point we'll go over how one treats an overdose of flecainide. But the bottom line is um, it always frightens me to give flecainide, particularly to infants because of concern that it can be overdosed. And I have seen it overdosed even in a hospital setting multiple times. Amiodarone uh, is um, one of the most potent antiarrhythmic agents that we uh, have. Um, it is a, a class three agent similar to Sotolol in that it has uh, potassium channel blockade agents. But um, as the marketing for Amio used to say, it has all four Vaughan William classification effects. So it's a calcium channel blocker, a beta blocker, um, a, a sodium channel blocker, and also a potassium channel blocker. Um, it's an extremely effective antiarrhythmic agent, and it's, uh, but it has a very long half-life. Uh, in adults, the half-life is 45 days. Um, it's, that's probably number one or number two longest half-life drugs known to mankind. Um, and so uh, when we are starting amiodarone in patients, we need to load them for a minimum of five to 10 days because of the very hot, long half-life of this agent. Um, one of the nice things about amiodarone is it has actually a very low incidence of proarrhythmia. So despite the fact that it has all of these various electrophysiologic effects, <clears throat> amio has a very low incidence of proarrhythmia. And that is one of the uh, reasons why it is a commonly used agent. Uh, we'll talk about this later on, but the biggest concern with amio in the short term, particularly in infants, is that when it's given IV, particularly while loading, uh, there is about a two to 5% incidence of cardiovascular collapse, uh, which is an idiosyncratic reaction that is believed to be related to diluent that IV amio comes in. Uh, 
Um, so we always want to be careful when we're giving amnio, particularly to young infants, uh, IV. There's a very high uh, side effect profile uh, for amnio for non-cardiac side effects. It can cause pulmonary fibrosis. It can cause liver dysfunction, thyroid. It can cause hyper or hypothyroidism. Uh, it can cause skin discoloration, particularly in the setting of sun exposure. So we always tell all patients on amnio that they should avoid direct sunlight and use uh, sunscreen very aggressively. It can have effects um, largely on the cornea. Uh, in fact, basically 100% of patients who take amiodarone have microdeposits on the cornea, which do not affect vision and which all resolve upon stopping amiodarone. Um, very rarely it can cause retinal uh, uh, issues. And most ophthalmologists think we're overkilling it by uh, calling an opto consult or evaluation for everyone on amio, but probably that should be done. So we always measure, uh, particularly in an older patient, we measure PFTs, liver functions, and thyroid functions before we start this agent, and we follow those on anybody who is on chronic amio. All of the things I've described as complications of amio are thankfully reversible with the exception of pulmonary fibrosis. And that is the reason why you cannot put somebody chronically on amiodarone unless they're very old. So it's not uncommon to see a 90 year old who maybe has AFib or some other arrhythmia to be put on chronic amio on the theory that when you're 90, if you live five more years, you've done pretty well and it's unlikely to get too sick from the side effects of amio. But amio is not a good long-term agent for basically almost any of our patients, even ACHD patients. It's not an unreasonable agent in the short term. It's a very safe agent. It can be given once a day, in fact, because of the half-life being so long. So it's very easy for parents to administer amio, particularly for infants. And in fact, in some countries, amio is the first line of therapy for SVT and babies on the theory that it's safe in short term and um, is easy for parents to administer. And it's always fascinating to me that when you have uh, patients from different countries, uh, even in developing nation, am nations, amiodarone is typically very easily available. Um, some of the other agents, not as easy. And so uh, you would be surprised at how many patients are on amiodarone. Um, so a good agent, but not a good long-term agent. Um, but as we've been discussing, drug are not a free ride. There are many side effects associated with them, some of which we've discussed, proarrhythmia, they're not always efficacious, compliance is an issue. And uh, for WPW, depending on the agent, it may not reduce the risk for sudden death. And so uh, as, a, and you know, for IART, drugs particularly are lousy. Uh, this is actually an abstract that was uh, performed many, many years ago now by Steve Weinling, but there've been a number of studies since that time essentially looking at the efficacy of um, various different antiarrhythmic agents at freedom from recurrence from IART. And the bottom line is, as you see, that you know almost none of these agents are better than digoxin at uh, preventing IART. You know, we'll often put a patient with this, with IART on sodalol or amiodarone, thinking that we have you know, picked an agent that's gonna be much better than a beta blocker or digoxin. Um, but really, there isn't a lot of evidence that that is in fact true. It doesn't mean there aren't some patients in whom they're effective, but oftentimes they're not very effective. Um, and that actually, and so those are the rationales why we move towards radiofrequency catheter ablation. It's potentially definitive. Um, and if you're successful, you often don't need to use drugs, particularly with IART, when patients have multiple circuits, we may not be able to ablate all of them but it's not uncommon in a Fontan type patient that we may alter the milieu adequately that a patient who was not controllable on antiarrhythmic agents can be easily controlled afterwards. So a lot of good rationale to proceed with ablation. And we're gonna talk a lot about ablation over the next uh, 12 months. Um, but uh, when we do an ablation, just so we're all on the same page, we need a minimum of two, four to five catheters, we usually have two cardiologists or uh, we're lucky that we have Josie, so we have uh, an MP and me, or Barry and me, or Barry and one of the techs. There's usually at least one nurse, one cardiovascular tech. Um, we have to have a computerized analysis. We have to have fluoro, obviously, although increasingly people are trying to do ablations without fluoro entirely. In fact, there are uh, 
number of reports of people doing ablations even in a treatment room without a fluoroscope at all. Um, and that's because of the advent of 3D mapping, which allows us in real time to see the catheters. And then of course you need a programmable stimulator. And typically we have a catheter that goes in the coronary sinus, one that's sitting in the area near the bundle of his, one in the right ventricle, one in the right atrium, and then an ablation catheter. And this is just an example of uh, of one, this is actually from a paper from the original uh, description of EAT ablation. And this is a five year old, and we see that with uh, 20 watts of energy, this was in an era before temperature controlled catheters. We had uh, usually with EAT ablations, you see an acceleration of the tachycardia followed by termination. This is an example of a child who has a uh, left sided accessory pathway and we're V pacing and we turn radio frequency energy on and within uh, one second, less than a second, we see uh, a change in the ventriculoatrial conduction pattern consistent with a successful ablation. And we're gonna go over these types of tracings a lot. So for the first year fellows, do not be concerned that you may not understand what we're looking at. And success rates for ablation are high. This is an interesting paper. It comes from all the way back in 1997, so like over 20 years ago. But you see that even uh, now Boston Children's at the time was the preeminent place for ablations. But these numbers are largely the same today as they were even way back in 97, which really is a testament to how extraordinarily good the group in Boston was. You have to understand RF ablation in children started only in like 1990 or 91. So uh, to report in 97, a five or six year experience and have you know, success rates in the 90 to 95% range for most ablation types is really quite remarkable. I'd like to say I was a fellow during the time this was done. So, so meaning that despite a lousy fellow, they still were able to achieve these levels. Uh, what are some of the risks associated with ablation? Well, the, all the normal cath risks, such as bleeding, stroke, infection, can even have uh, death from ablation. You can have coronary injury uh, with ventricular dysfunction, uh, stroke, perforation. Um, in that same study, there was an incidence of about 1% of serious complications associated with ablation. I think today the number is probably similar. If you take all centers in the United States in the hands of good operators, it's probably a little below 1%, but for sure is not zero. Um, now, when we're talking about a Fontan, uh, there's a lot of reasons why success rates for Fontan ablations are so low. This is an angio. In the old days, we used to do an angiogram of the right atrium. This is an old style Fontan, an RA to PA anastomosis, but look how gigantic the RA was in these patients. So you have a huge amount of ground to cover. Oftentimes there are multiple scars with multiple circuits. And the other uh, aspect is that the uh, myocardium of the atrium of a Fontan is typically scarified and very thick, in fact, sections from path specimens show that in some patients, the atrium is as thick as their ventricle. So when you're trying to make a, a deep lesion to block a circuit of tachycardia, you could imagine, you know, first of all, you have to identify the circuit. Second of all, you have to identify the right place to ablate. And then finally, you have to have enough contact with the surface of the myocardium and enough power delivery to make a deep enough lesion. To, uh, to, to block a circuit. And so with all of those technical challenges, it's not surprising that success rates for ablation of IART are far lower than they are for regular SVT. Um, and this is an old slide saying that the arrhythmia-free incidence was about 50% a two-year follow-up, but let me tell you, it's still almost exactly the same. There have been some improvements in catheter design uh, specifically, we now have contact force catheters that tell us how much pressure we're putting on the myocardium, which is important because uh, sometimes we deliver energy and we didn't realize that we weren't even touching the heart in these patients. Uh, we have irrigated catheters, which we'll go over in a moment, but despite that, we're still not uh, doing that well. We're using CARTO increasingly, which is an electroanatomical system. So for just so we're all on the same page, 
<clears throat> using Carto or the alternative is the St. Jude product. Essentially there in Carto, there is a magnetic field that is uh, around the patient's chest. And when the catheter enters the magnetic field, there's a chip on the tip of the catheter that distorts the three dimensions uh, in the X, Y, and Z dimensions, allowing the system to see it in real time. So you can see your catheter moving on Carto. Um, and the system will record both uh, the electrical signal on the tip of the catheter, as well as the position of the catheter when it recorded that signal, hence electrical and anatomical or electroanatomical. Uh, similarly, the competitor product does the same thing. Um, and when we're looking at a CARTO map, as this little drawing shows, uh, red is early, uh, the hot colors are early, the cold colors such as purple and green are late. So presumably the arrhythmia is arising from this area and then uh, the impulse is uh, further away and later in this area, the atrium in this little example. We also have, as I mentioned before, irrigation catheters. Uh, some of you uh, second and third year fellows have ablated with Barry uh, and you probably have noticed that he uses irrigation on almost all of his ablations. Um, and the reason he uses that catheter is not so much for the irrigation, but uh, the Boston, I'm sorry, the uh, Carto cath ablation catheter that has irrigation also has contact force allowing us to know how many grams of force we're putting on the myocardium. Barry likes to see that number when he's ablating. So sometimes he'll ablate using that catheter, but not use irrigation. But irrigation will allow for a deeper uh, deeper lesions. So one has to be careful when using this, but it is particularly effective for Fontan patients in whom we're treating IART. Uh, but Barry will use it in standard uh, ablations and usually use somewhat lower power. We also have cryoablation. Um, the benefit of cryoablation is that it causes uh, reversible lesions, at least initially. The lesions are smaller and um, one can sort of do what they call cryo map, meaning that you turn on the cryo energy, you see the impact of your lesion in the first say 30 to 60 seconds, assuming you like the, uh, what you see, you can then uh, continue to cryo ablate for longer than a minute and you'll start to see permanent effects. If one saw an effect that you were not happy with, you could turn off the cryo energy. And in the majority of cases, if you've turned off early enough, meaning within 30 to 60 seconds, most of the impact is reversible. So uh, the classic example of using cryo is there are some centers that use cryo exclusively for AV nova reentrant tachycardia because of concerns of potentially causing heart blocks. Sunny, I know you probably saw it in Stanford. I know Dr. Uh, uh, Sereznak and the team there are using cryo almost exclusively for AVNRT. Uh, another common area that cryo is used is for pathways that are located close to the AV node. So if we go on on cryo near the AV node and we start to see AV nodal injury, if you turn off with cryo quickly enough, the likelihood of a permanent lesion is, uh, or injury to the AV node is very low, as opposed to radiofrequency where even two to three seconds could cause a permanent injury. Um, the disadvantage of cryo is that unfortunately is not as effective as radiofrequency energy. And in virtually every study of cryo, the success rate is about uh, two to 5% lower when using cryo energy. But a lot of electrophysiologists, particularly pediatric electrophysiologists are happy to accept a slightly lower efficacy rate if the uh, safety is enhanced. So just to uh, recap, uh, we're refining our newer mapping strategies, uh, particularly for IRT. We have surgical approaches to IART. You know that when a surgeon performs a cryoablation in the operating room, that's extremely effective. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that uh, Fontan revision with intraoperative cryoablation is by far the most effective way of treating uh, flutter in the Fontan patient. The problem is it's an extremely large, uh, very morbid operation. So you have to have a really good rationale for doing it. We have newer catheter designs such as uh, contact force, cryocatheters, et cetera. And of course, a lot of you know that I've been very interested and have published a lot on the use of lowering our fluoroscopy 
which is largely done through a combination of newer fluoroscopic techniques, but the, uh, also the advent of 3D electroanatomical mapping. And I think with that, we'll stop for today. Uh, and um, next week, we'll start our regular EP conference where we uh, show interesting tracings and have uh, little mini lectures, but mostly interesting tracings. Does anybody have any questions or want to discuss anything? Um, Dr. Pass, I just had a quick question about, um, you mentioned for transplants, you can't use uh, adenosine and um, Verapamil is uh, um, not a good choice for uh, infants. So what would be your choice then? Well, um, I think uh, it's a good question. You mean if a transplant patient was an infant and by the way, had SVT? Yes. Um, I think probably the answer is I would use something like procainamide uh, or uh, potentially even amiodarone. The other thing that's interesting about SVT treatment, you know, in the old days, and this precedes my time as a physician, but if you talk to like Rika Arnott, um, she'll tell you that in the 1970s and the 1980s, if somebody came into the hospital in SVT, it was very routine to put them on digoxin, maybe to digitalize them, and then leave them in SVT. And within 24 hours, they would terminate. Um, and uh, today, of course, we would, we would view that as, um, you know, I don't know, it frightens us to see anybody in SVT for 10 seconds. We have to immediately treat it. But the reality is in somebody with a normal structural heart, with normal function, there is no harm to, you know, slowly treating SVT. And so I think the bottom line is I would personally avoid the use of uh, adenosine. I know that Eric and Leo have published these data showing that they had no problems, but I'm telling you, uh, I have seen it myself. It absolutely can happen. Uh, now, we know for sure that the combination of persantine, which is an antiplatelet agent that is used in some centers for transplant patients, and adenosine is a lethal combination that can cause a uh, cardiac standstill. Probably that is the most important reason that transplant patients when they get adenosine can sometimes die. Um, a lot of centers have moved away from the use of persantine. We do not use it here. I think they just use aspirin. Uh, and that's mostly to prevent coronary thrombosis and stuff like that. But I think the bottom line is we would probably use another agent other than uh, either of those in an infant. The other thing I would say is, for reasons that I'm not entirely sure I understand, it's very unusual to see reentrant SVT in a transplanted heart. I don't know if the ischemic time of taking the heart out and putting it back in is causing these pathways to uh, stop conducting, um, but we very rarely see reentrant arrhythmias in these patients. It's not unheard of, but it's pretty uncommon. Um, interestingly, a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper, a case report where a donor heart had WPW and uh, based on the surface electrocardiogram of the donor, we could uh, guess that it was in the left lateral position and we actually had the surgeon surgically cryoablate the pathway uh, in the bucket. Basically, before he sewed the heart in, we had him place one uh, linear cryo lesion on the lateral mitral annulus and the, and the patient was no longer pretty excited. A very interesting case. We, we had this very cool uh, title, we called it like um, ablation in the bucket, but the authors, the, I'm sorry, the editors of the journal liked the, liked the article, but they didn't like our title. And so we had to change it to something like ex vivo ablation of a heart or something like that. But uh, anyways, um, the bottom line is it's a good question, but thankfully it's very uncommon to see SVT in uh, transplant patients. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Okay. All right, guys, uh, we'll see you in a few minutes and sign out. I uh, hope everybody has a wonderful week ahead. Jeez, speak soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.